Good morning. A perfect morning to be in God's house. Glad you could be here today. I can briefly review for you what our Advent series has looked like over the past three weeks. The Lord comes near, and as He does, first we talked about He humbles Himself to serve as our Savior. Then last week, the Lord is near and He humbles us through His call to repentance so that we trust in Him as our Savior. Which brings us to today, the Lord is near. He is the one who humbles our enemies so that we can be at peace. The order of service is in your hands in the service folder. We're starting at page four. You may remain seated at this point. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. We light three Advent candles remembering Jesus, the light of the world. He came to defeat the Prince of Darkness. We remember Jesus who came in answer to his people's prayers. John proclaimed him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We hear his call to see the light. We light three Advent candles as a sign of our trust and confidence. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Through your word and spirit, may our souls be blessed. Please stand. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things we should not have done, and we have not done those things we should have done. 
Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, Lord Jesus Christ, and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts and fill us with your light, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians, also the basis for the sermon. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Gospel from the third chapter of Luke. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, What should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you. The hymn of the day.
I don't remember all the details, but it went something like this. There was an elderly lady who was homebound, couldn't get out of her house anymore. This was at the congregation that I used to serve in Georgia, so every once in a while, like other members of the congregation who couldn't get out, I would go out to her and see her. She lived a little bit farther out than some of the other people in the, into the next suburb, but I'd go see her every month or every other month. And, well, it's not her real name, but we'll just call her Mrs. Smith. I'd go out and see Mrs. Smith, and we would sit down in her front room, and if memory serves me, I think she was sort of in the habit of leaving the television on while we would talk for a little while, so television would be playing, we'd be sitting there in the front room having a little conversation. Then after a little while, we'd turn the TV off and there'd be a devotion and we'd have the Lord's Supper. Well, one of the times that I went out to her house, we were just sitting in that front room having another conversation and there was, there was a little bit of a lull in the conversation because she had just seen something on TV that as she was watching it out of the corner of her eye, she was she was, she was looking at something and somehow she saw, you know, somebody said some awful thing or somebody did some awful thing and she, she looked at it and there was this little lull in the conversation and there was Mr. Mrs. Smith and in her nice, calm, sweet voice, she just said, you know, sometimes you just want to take certain people and shake them. <laughs> I still laugh about that when I think about that today. It's like, that was her way of thinking about how you can fix what's wrong in the world. Well, there are, there are plenty of things that are wrong in the world. And in your little part of the world, it's probably not all that difficult to identify what those things are. Sometimes, just like Mrs. Smith, you see something on a screen, which is like almost like, like the only place you see anything these days. You see something on a screen, somebody says something, they do something that's just really off and wrong and shouldn't be, and it, and it genuinely sets you off. Nor is there any real shortage of those kinds of things happening in real time, like with the actual people that you interact with. Here are some examples. I, I think you can see where this is going to be going. Um, I'm driving on the new bypass, 59, on the southwest corner of town there. Skirts all the way around the city. I'm driving there, and all of a sudden, this little Honda starts zipping past me, you know, with those exhaust tips. It sounds like a motocross instead of a car. Comes zipping past me and swerves right in front of me, and I... I, I uh, I'm in the grocery store, just standing there in the produce department, <laughs> and this lady starts... I'm in line at the quick trip. All I'm there to do is get a cup of coffee. They got the stickers on the floor when you check out, so you still have to stay six feet away from each other, and I'm standing there with a coffee, and, and this guy in front of me turns around, and he starts telling me, I was taking my second hour class at UW and the professor, he starts talking about, you know where this is going, right? There are, there are things like how we're doing, how we're feeling, and, and what we're going to actually do next are oftentimes affected by people around us. The things that they're saying, the things that they're doing. People who quite often are going to be doing and saying things that the Lord, would, the Lord really wouldn't want them to be saying. With that kind of thing in mind, I hope that you don't think I'm being too dismissive by saying there's nothing for you to worry about. People, 
people can say and do some awfully aggravating things. But still, there's nothing for you to worry about. Especially, especially when people are doing things that are going against what God says. And you know it. And it becomes burdensome to you and bothersome to you because you know that this isn't what the Lord would want to be happening here. Especially that's when that's the case. It's truer than ever. And not just because I came up with it as a sermon theme. It's not something I came up with. It's right out of the Bible passage that we have for the reading today. Especially then when it's bothersome because you know it's not according to what God would want. There is nothing for you to worry about. I'll quickly give you the two points that God makes in this reading that bear that out. First, changing what unbelievers are saying or doing is not your problem. It's not. When God calls on us to be His children, as, we're interact, as you're interacting with people, God wants you to be diplomatic, not domineering. He wants you to be known for kindness and restraint, not for getting in people's faces. As children of your Father in heaven, the objective is to not be intemperate, losing your cool, to not be intolerant of other people. Make your gentleness known to people is what Paul emphasizes. Why? Because you know that the Lord is near. Jesus is close to returning. And if there are those, it's the theme of our service today, if there are those who are going to go against His will and oppose His ways, well, you and I can stand down. Because he'll, he'll be the one who takes care of that, if and when and as he chooses. Secondly, reason for there's, there, there's no, no reason for you to worry about anything? Well, there's, there's an awfully good alternative to worrying about it, which is praying about it. The old hymn, Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged Take it to the Lord in prayer. St. Peter somewhat famously said it this way, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Make your requests known to God. I know it might sound trite, but it's true. Let God worry about it. He'll take care of it. Whatever it is that's bothering you, Put it on his shoulders. Take it to him. He'll help you get through it. He will deliver. So there you have it. Just like that. God's rationale for telling you that you don't have to worry about a thing. The Lord Jesus is near. He will take care of the opposition. And when you come to him in prayer, he will give you what you need. Done deal. Very good. Let's go get some curbside takeout. Have lunch. We're done. Except for the fact that sadly, somehow we've gotten very good at turning these words, Philippians 4, 4 to 7, the sermon reading for right now, Somehow we've gotten very good at turning those words on their head so that they sound a little bit more like this. Complain about everything always. I will say it again. Complain. Let your assertiveness be known to all. People should not mess with you. 
Do not be calm about anything, but in everything, make sure that nobody's giving you any flack for anything. And if you want some peace of mind, well, then you need to keep looking out for number one. <sighs> how does that happen? How, how do we get... It's almost like you can pick any reading from the Bible. How does it happen that we end up being good at doing the opposite of what God says. You remember that story that Jesus told about the rich man and poor Lazarus? The rich man died, cut off from God. He was pleading with Father Abraham for just, just send Lazarus so that I can just have a drop of water. He said, because I am in agony in this fire, he cried. No rest, no sleep, no pain meds, no medically induced coma, and not a single drop of water to cool his tongue. Our angry attitudes, our arrogant intolerance, our penchant for always wanting to win out over others instead of to be yielding. What God would have us be doing as we interact with people. When we have worries and concerns, put it on His shoulder. But then there's our infrequent prayers. Our prayers that so often are lacking as far as thanksgiving is concerned. All of that puts us standing right there next to that wretched rich man. Till Jesus Christ cried out his version of, I am in agony in this fire, which was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The one who rejoiced in the Lord always cut off as if he had done nothing but complain his whole life long. The one who was always yielding to others cut off as if he were all the time overbearing and mean and angry toward people. The one who never worried about things, but always put things on the Father's shoulders, cut off as if he had never prayed to God for help. All our sin in his body and none of what I just said is to guilt you. It's just the opposite. I, I, I know how that sometimes sounds. When, when we're presenting Jesus as the innocent one, he didn't do anything wrong, and it's all of our, our sin and guilt that caused him to suffer and die on the cross. It's almost like it's having the wrong effect, saying, well, yeah, that was so unjust. It would just feel so bad that that had to be. That's not where that's supposed to go. Just the opposite. This is not to guilt you. This is where your peace with God, you know, at the end of almost every sermon, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, it's the last verse of the reading to, for today. This is where that comes from. That all of our sin going to Jesus, He was completely willing to take it all. There was never a second that He was thinking, well, this really stinks. I didn't do anything wrong. He willingly took every last bit of it. On the middle cross, outside the city of Jerusalem. After what happened there, God had poured out every last drop of His anger at our sin. And there isn't any more. There's this, there's this perfectly winsome way that God says it 
through Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah 43, almost, almost like if I could come out of the pulpit and just get closer to you and look you right in the eye, that's how God is saying what he says in Isaiah 43. When he looks right at you and says, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Let that be what fills up your soul with a peaceful calm. The peace of God that transcends all understanding. I have a feeling that perhaps more people than usual are going to be drinking too much on the evening of December 31st, bound and determined to kiss this year goodbye for good. I would encourage you in advance to not take up that attitude toward this past year. You know, if, if the sum and substance of this sermon were, don't worry, be happy, well, we could just as easily strike up a reggae beat and all sing together the Bob Marley song. Don't worry, be happy. But the truth is, if Psalm 118 says, this is the day the Lord has made, we would, we would also be justified in changing out the word day and just putting, putting in the word year and saying the whole passage. This is the year that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. God telling you that there is nothing to worry about is something that is centered completely in Jesus Christ. He is near. The day that He comes to destroy His enemies and take out all of the opposition and take us through the gates of pearl, down the streets of gold, into bliss forever, that day this is not rocket science. That day is a day closer than it was at yesterday this time. And it just keeps getting closer. The day when Jesus takes care of all of the opposition. In connection with Jesus Christ, it's gentleness, not anger. In connection with Christ Jesus, who is near, it's prayer, not anxiety. In Christ Jesus, there is nothing for you to worry about. And since it's time to close the sermon, it's high time to say that in the positive way. In Christ Jesus, there is everything for you to rejoice about. The, the passage doesn't say rejoice in general. It says rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again because Jesus Christ makes it happen for you. Rejoice. Amen. The peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand. The Confession of Faith. Today, the Apostles' Creed, page 10. We speak together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
We pray. Lord of heaven and earth, we marvel at your love as we prepare ourselves for the coming of Christ at Christmas. We find joy in the fact that even though we are sinners, your forgiveness is offered to us with no strings attached. You freely pardon us of all our sins because your sinless Son, Jesus, took our sins upon himself by dying and rising again to make us right with God. Lord, help us live every day without fear. Help us be faithful to you during this busy holiday season. We pray for the families of Faye Whitney and Urban Malosh, whose souls you have taken to heaven. Dry their tears and assure them that their Christian loved ones are with you in heaven, and we will see them again because Jesus rose from the grave. Help us use every day wisely until you call us to our eternal home. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name and as you taught, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated. Again, very glad that you can be in God's house today. Two quick announcements. Pastor Christie will be in the building tomorrow morning for Sunday morning Bible study called The Annual Adventure of Advent. That'll be in the fellowship hall twice between the three services. And then there are full color Trinity yard signs available to pick up to put in your front yard to let the neighborhood know that we'll have Christmases, Christmas services here to which they are invited. Thank you. God be with you.